So monetary policy is normally focused on traditional variables like inflation and unemployment, but certainly since the crisis, there's been a lot more momentum around financial stability and whether or not that should be a goal of the Fed too or an explicit goal. Do you think this is the right job for the Fed? And uh, can you think of situations where this could even conflict with its primary mandate? Mm -hmm. So as you know, I think financial stability is this very important issue that some authorities need to be focused on. And before the crisis, I think the idea of financial regulation for the system as a whole wasn't anyone's primary responsibility. And so I think it is important for someone, some entity, to be responsible for it. Um, the central bank is a natural to entity to consider financial stability risks in the sense that its choice of monetary policy is going to affect the price of risk in the system mm -hmm. and therefore you know the way all assets are priced and so it clearly has an impact um, but it has basically one tool um, a policy rate a short mm -hmm. rate and one tool can achieve only so much you know when you ask too much of it it may not do very well so I I am a believer in a single target with a um, single mandate, um, but that leaves some a need for financial stability to be somebody's primary authority. Um, the to the extent, I mean, one reason it's so important, and I get just to back up and make sure to set the ground rules. I think some of the research that has come out since. The crisis, and maybe some of it was there before in some of the emerging markets, is that financial recessions are costly, and they're more costly in terms of output and growth than a normal recession. I think what we're finding, or some researchers are finding, and this work needs to be continued, is that they may actually lead to a lower permanent potential output path. Mm -hmm. And so you usually thought of, you know, output on this upward trend and cycles kind of revolve around this upward trend. But it looks like the trend actually, you know, gets some kinks in it or, or every so often because of a crisis. And so I think it's super important. Um, the Fed has a lot of responsibilities. I've been doing some work recently on how countries are approaching um, macro prudential mm -hmm. policies. And here I'm thinking about like the time varying policies, not just higher capital, but like capital that could be adjusted or LTVs that could be adjusted. And um, there's a mix of how countries are adopting new committees or entities to do this. And I think every country will find the right mix. There's no single thing. Um, but I think one of the takeaways that's really important is that they're finding that we're finding, um, based on a sample of, say, 58 countries, big countries, most of global GDP, um, the Ministry of Finance or some elected official has to, they want them to have a say in this po these kinds of policies. And um, so I think that suggests there's a lot of political element to it and how far you want to push the central bank into mm -hmm. that when it already has a number of other responsibilities, I think is... Um, a very open question. And Do you worry it could undermine independence? That's exactly. So mm -hmm. um, there's two things. The political economy question, which is undermining. I think we know that political independence for monetary policy, or at least goal dependence. So they think about independence for central banks usually as like um, mandates and mm -hmm. goals, and then tool independence. And so this, the Federal Reserve, it has independence for how it conducts policy. It has a Fed funds rate. It's independent in how it sets it. But the tool of the Fed funds rate and the inflation mandate or the price stability mandate is established by the ele electorate. Mm -hmm. It's established by Congress or the administration. So it has two different levels mm -hmm. of independence. And it's important for inflation stability that that operational independence be established for central banks. And there's been research to support mm -hmm. that that helps to achieve price stability. Um, if the central bank has to also do financial stability um, on its own as a, a primary authority, I do think it sort of brings it into the realm of, of policies that could have some distributional consequences. 
like LTVs have clearly distributional consequences in the sense of, you know, it, it, it can determine who's going to get a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And that's usually a big social issue for every economy. And so having the central bank make those decisions, mm -hmm. I think, is, uh, puts that at risk. Um, so that's my, um, so I do worry about independence if it takes on a prominent, prominent role. But it should be involved because of its expertise. So what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, does it yeah. does it mean that we have a new regulatory body and the Fed's yeah. involved? Do we bring into an existing yeah. regulatory body and they work with the Fed? Yeah. So um, this is a paper I'm currently working on, and um, so I might change my mind in six months <laughs> as I learn a little bit more. It's but a let me tell you, it is <laughs> research is a process. Um, but we looked at. 58 countries that have done some kind of macro prudential tool over the last decades or so. And in 47 of the 58, they've created new committees, multi-agency committees, and um, which suggests these, and most of them were done after the crisis. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a popular trend. And in each of them, there's, the central bank is involved in like, you know, all, all of them. The prudential bank regulator is involved in all of them, usually a market regulator. And then the Ministry of Finance is actually involved in many of them, mm -hmm. either formally, they could be the chair, or they even as an informal observer. But no country kind of created a new agency with its own authorities. Mm -hmm. So they all went and said, you know, financial stability and macro prudential policy is it needs to incorporate all the existing regulators. And a lot of it is about, if you're regulating for the system, you should bring in all the players who know about the system. So they created a committee structure, um, which I think is important. But every entity on that committee has its own set of incentives mm -hmm. and skills and incentives. Um, so you want the prudential regulator, because many of these tools affect financial institutions. Mm -hmm. there are, they're implemented through financial institutions. Um, but they generally aren't macro-oriented, or maybe their, their specialization has not been sort of systemic mm -hmm. risk. They're, think of them as micro-prudential regulators. Central banks have the macro skills um, and have sort of the, because of their independence for monetary policy, sort of have this sense of, implementing policies early, mm -hmm. sort of taking away the punch bowl kind of idea, and they know how to do that mm -hmm. because of by doing that for monetary policy, so they would be good. Um, but again, because many of these policies could have distributional effects, the Ministry of Finance or some government entities involved. So I think it's interesting that every co most countries, the vast majority of countries are setting these up. Um, to me, right now, Again, mm -hmm. my mind could, I could change my mind in six months. Um, a system where the Ministry of Finance is the chair of the committee, because they have a, sort of a role of coordinating agencies mm -hmm. and have the um, backing of the elected electorate. And the central bank, though, having a prominent role, perhaps making recommendations, make, perhaps making them pu in public. Mm -hmm to the Ministry of Finance for whether a tool should be used or not. And, and it's, it becomes a public discussion. I think that actually could have some um, potential to be effective. Um, so I, I've been, so a couple countries have that in mm -hmm. place. Um, and I think we'll find out over the next couple years, this is part of the research that I'm doing right now, is has this affected how they're actually taking policy actions. And because um, one could, can see all the different incentives, mm -hmm. and so now you want to see does it actually you know, um, have an effect. And my guess is it will have some effect, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of tools that have been sort of activated yet. Mm -hmm. So we may have a small sample problem for a while. So, this you know, is but a it's a, it is a process. <laughs> and I, I, found, I found it to be. Interesting, from a research perspective, we always just say, well, there's monetary policy, mm -hmm. there's macro prudential policy, and we spend a lot of time thinking how they interact and whatnot, and we can then separate monetary policy from macro prudential policy because the monetary policy makers can say, 
oh, there's somebody else who's supposed to do macro pro. And then, but if in practice it turns out that somebody else is not going to be a very effective body, then you kind of have to think a little bit differently, or you have to change that body so they can be. But you need to, well, that's what research is for. <laughs> no matter who does this, yeah. you know, there will be a lot of political yeah. pressure. Yes. And it seems like there's even more political pressure on the Fed now, even with yeah. its mandate. I mean, if you increase rates a quarter of a point and the stock market dips even a little, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, you, people are just freaking out yeah. and being like, they don't know, you know, we need to remove these people. Um, so one way, I mean, I don't know if it works or arguably if we're even doing it, is, you know, they say rules, um, mm -hmm. like monetary policy rules or even inflation targeting sort of helps you get around that. Yeah. It's like, hey, we have a rule, we're doing yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Um, does mo macro prudential policy have to be discretionary? Is it possible to bring rules into it? Mm -hmm. So there have been a few people who proposed rules for mm -hmm. this very reason, this inaction bias. Yeah. I don't. My view mm -hmm. is it's the evidence isn't there yet mm -hmm. to have to develop that rule mm -hmm. um, with confidence that you understand how these policies actually affect the mm -hmm. economy. I think we need to build a bit more of experience with the use of these tools before we could write down a rule. Mm -hmm. A rule's not out of the question if you think it's, if your biggest problem is policy inaction mm -hmm. bias, then a rule is very helpful. Yeah. But you kind of want more confidence in your role before you <laughs> sort of you take that on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think it's certainly a possibility, and you know I know people have proposed things like that. And um, but I think it's not. I don't think. You know, as a as a general matter, we actually know enough. So discretion would be more prudent until we understand this better. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I. You know, we there's some empirical work. But it's um, a reduced form. It's not, you know, which says some of these tools can have some effects and they go in the directions you think. Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of potential endogeneity. Mm -hmm. We don't actually understand all the channels. Um, so I think it needs a bit more time. It took monetary policy a long time mm -hmm. to get to where it is. So That's true. It's still changing. And still mm -hmm. changing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the other part of your question I would just um, respond to is sort of a lot of volatility around, you know, an interest rate mm -hmm. change, et cetera. So I would distinguish financial market volatility from financial stability. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, f financial instability is going to have a lot of volatility, but you can have volatile markets and still have a pretty stable system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if the, if the Fed wants to make changes to rates and it's worried about volatility and, and, you know, this idea that it's responding to the stock market, mm -hmm. not just to the economy, there's kind of a, a put. I think it could anchor some of that discussion about are they really, is it really a put on the stock market, is it a risk, by thinking about whether, like, the underlying financial system is resilient. Mm -hmm or if there's signs of vulnerabilities that might create costs to economic growth down the road. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of trade off, because you know if you ease a bit, you're going to you know, get some growth and tighten up volatility, and that's all good. And that's usually great, unless you've got a system that's kind of fragile on the edge, and all you're doing is sort of building into this, mm -hmm. building into sort of this view that any time it gets volatile, the Fed will come and and um, and you know and support come back in and mm -hmm. support the system. So, for example, if you were to do something like this is um, some of the work on growth at risk that we've been working on, which is if your vulnerabilities are really high and then you start to ease whenever markets get volatile, you're going to be more likely to have sort of a cost to that mm -hmm. two or three years down the road than if your vulnerabilities are actually quite low. You know, so let's say you're just coming out of a recession. Easing when you get volatility is mm -hmm. help over the economy. If you've been at this for a long time and there's a lot of credit or a lot of leverage in the financial system, easing on signs of volatility could raise costs down the road. So I think there's a way to use, think about financial stability and monetary policy without 
targeting financial stability. Do you think the Fed, though, still has that sort of, I mean, a true freedom? I mean, it's hard to imagine a Paul Volcker doing what he did now. Yeah. So that's, I think, I think um, the current chair thinks, mm -hmm. believes he can do what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. Um, he has a mandate for price stability, and I think he believes he will be able to function mm -hmm. and continue to execute that. So, I mean, I, I think if you were to ask him, he'd say, mm -hmm. I could do that if I had to do that. Yeah. Um, do people watch the Fed closer now, do you think, than they used to? Oh, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like everything is under a little bit more of a microscope. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I guess you know the Fed chair is always a household name. Yeah. That's true. But like when your That's cab true. driver is like, that rate cut, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry to hear that. <laughs> do you get that? Do, um, do when you take cabs? <laughs> you know, that's what people said during the, um, in the bubble, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. No, I don't, fortunately. <laughs> um, but it is, it, um, I think there's just everything is under more scrutiny now. Yeah. So uh, maybe more so than. I know when um, Ben Bernanke became chair, mm -hmm. he really did want to make it more about the institution and less about a person. Mm -hmm. That was one of his objectives. Um, I don't know if he succeeded, but he, that was an objective. <laughs> <laughs> he had said, you know, there's, there's more transparency. This is an institution. It's not a person. Um, but, you know. <laughs> I hope so. But even in a perfect world, if, yeah. you know, you know, the Fed had all the power to do what it needed to do. Yeah. Does it have the tools to measure and control risk in the financial mm -hmm. system? Do they mm -hmm. exist? Mm -hmm. um, it does not, as a practical matter. Do they exist? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, as a practical matter, they are not the macro prudential authority mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, they are a regulator. And they were given authority to regulate some of the largest institutions for systemic risk, mm -hmm. not just for safety and soundness. So in that sense, they are a macro prudential regulator. And they have some tools for the banking sector. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of writing in my past where I, like this one chart I love to show, which is how much credit in the US is held by the banks versus mm -hmm the non-bank sector. And if you go back to the 1960s, the banks had two-thirds of it, and insurance companies and pension funds had the other third of it. And now it's like, um, you know, a third of it, the mm -hmm. whole thing. So there's, there is um, insurance companies and pension funds, but there's mutual funds. The GSEs have a lot of the, whole, of the credit. Now we have mutual funds. Um, we had the growth of money market funds, so the ABS, mm -hmm. you start adding it up, and the banks are a pretty small fraction, not nearly the two-thirds, mm -hmm. and probably now like one-third of a much bigger credit market. So if you just continue to clamp mm -hmm. on the banks, it, in, this, in our system, in the U.S. system, where you have other non-bank institutions and markets, this activity can you know, migrate, and it's just leakages from macroprudential tools. So I think the Fed itself doesn't have the, um, the tools on its own. Um, FSOC has some tools. Mm -hmm. um, What's FSOC? FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, mm -hmm. was created under Dodd-Frank to be sort of the macroprudential mm -hmm. authority, and the Secretary of the Treasury is the chair. Mm -hmm. um, it has some tools, and um, the central bank is a member of that. And so that, in some sense, is, in my view, the accountable authority mm -hmm. for financial stability. Um, but you bring up a good point, that because it's not just about banks now, mm -hmm. like, say, insurance companies are regulated, yeah. actually at the state level. Right. So now you've got, it's like what they say when everyone's accountable, no one's accountable? Yeah. That's, in some sense, that's why these committees were I think created, mm -hmm. only some countries have actually tried to make them accountable. Like, mm -hmm. for example, they're formal, they have a chair, there's a voting process, they might have some tools. Like, those are four basic things to make a committee, like, effective. Um, many, many of these committees don't have all four of those attributes. Mm -hmm. Many committees don't have 
two of those attributes. So, so I think there's still some learning in this. Pro you know, these committees are all new. There's still uncertainty about who the accountable authority is, and um, I think that's something that you know needs attention. And uh, with experience, we'll see how they perform. Um, but right now, I think we're still at the very beginning of this. Yeah, it feels like the wild last forever. Yeah. <laughs> Is Absolutely. There, is there anything else you want to discuss or any research topics you think people should be interested in or doing, young yeah, scholars? Yeah. So um, I mentioned a bit earlier, I do think one of the more interesting issues out there, especially for this, this group, uh, macro financial, is in the macro world, there's a lot of discussion about what's potential going forward in the advanced economies. Mm -hmm. Um, potential and growth. Potential growth and R star mm -hmm. and low growth. And one could imagine that if it's a pretty low R star, the next recession that comes along, how much room is there for monetary policy to, mm -hmm. to offset a recession? And trying to make sure, so does that kind of system, and I'm not saying that's Mm -hmm. what I agree with. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying if that is a world that we might be in, should that affect how we think about how much capital the, the financial system should have? Mm -hmm. Like, should they be more resilient and be able to, to sort of also be a counter-cyclical mm -hmm. tool because other t tools that have gotten us out of recessions in the past are going to be less able to do so? And so is there an interaction between the monetary policy and how the financial system should be uh, structured and how resilient it needs to be? Um, something I think people are thinking about, and I think that would be you know, just this fascinating kind of work to, to spend some time yeah, on. Yeah, I guess a low interest rate world poses a lot of risks too because it also encourages more leverage. Yes, it could. If, yeah, so low interest rates encourage leverage, mm -hmm. and leverage isn't bad per se. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of, that's how monetary policy works, and when yeah. people borrow. Um, it, uh, but if, it, if you're in a world where nominal return targets are still high, when rates are low, and then you have to get, use leverage to achieve some kind of return, then mm -hmm. that's probably not the right um, model. And so um, that could be that could be costly. That's like what we would call a vulnerability building in the system. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think Chris Sims earlier today, you know, not all credit is bad. Yeah. I don't think anyone wants to say all credit is bad. Credit helps the economy grow. Um, and so it is difficult to know when it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where some of the, I think, some of the more interesting research that's going on right now is trying to make some inroads on. For sure, structural change. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. All right, well, thank you so much. Sure.